He is a past director of the general practice residency programs at Ravenswood in Illinois at Masonic Medical Center, where he continues to direct the journal club for residents. He, is currently, he currently maintains a private practice in Skokie, Illinois. Please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Elliot Ack. Good afternoon, all. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, can I make a request of you guys? Can can you come a little forward here? Can we? I feel like I'm. I can't make eye contact with folks. Can you move forward a little bit? Well, okay, that's a little better. I think, yeah. Um, again, thank you for inviting me here. Thanks to the faculty. Um, nice being in Ann Arbor. I had a little tour of the campus this morning. I've been here a few times. Um, I remember my first time in Ann Arbor. Uh, it was when I was an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin, and a bunch of my, can I say University of Wisconsin? Is that okay? Is that? And I, uh, I hopped in the car with a bunch of my buddies, and we hightailed it over here to Ann Arbor for a football game, and uh, Wisconsin lost to Michigan in football that day by a final score of 56 to nothing. Uh, of course, the game was not as close as the score might indicate. We got completely destroyed. Uh, I don't think that happens too much lately, but um, <laughs> I'm not here to talk about football or actually ice hockey, something I really know something about, uh, but actually EBD, my journey into evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based dental practice. And I don't want to be so presumptuous to think that I'm going to highly inspire any of you or uh, even motivate you, but if you listen to my story and how certain things affected me, I hope your story isn't like mine for a whole host of reasons, um, at least I'd like to get you to start thinking about certain things in terms of science and evidence and possibly incorporating evidence into your clinical practice. So my story really begins in 1979. Again, I was a graduate student in the Department of Oral Pathology, so I went to grad school actually before I went to dental school. And I went to grad school in what I think you'd probably all agree is the finest dental school in the country, and that would be the University of Illinois College of Dentistry. Um, but Joking aside, in the 40s and 50s, the University of Illinois was actually a pretty well-known place for research and scholarly activity. Why is that? There was something that I think is sort of informally referred to as the Vienna Connection. So in Europe in the 30s, uh, because of obviously the political climate that was going on there, there were quite a number of Jewish professionals who were really trying to leave Europe. And we had somebody at the University of Illinois who was a guy by the name of Maury Masler, who was responsible for bringing some of these folks to the university. I, I think the faculty will recognize some names. I don't know if the students will, but we had people named Harry Sisher, Joseph Weinman, who wrote a book called Bone and Bones, which is a very famous textbook. Somebody named Ballant Orban. Have you heard of like Orban's oral histology, the Orban knife, fam famous periodontist? And the probably the last surviving member of the Vienna Connection was Dr. Julia Meyer. So in 1979, when I got to the University of Illinois, Dr. Meyer was the last surviving member of that Vienna connection. And in 1979, uh, she was elderly, she was frail, she didn't even stand five feet tall, and she scared the crap out of all of us, including the faculty, okay? So we would have faculty meetings and she would ask a question to the faculty, and even the faculty would stumble and bumble over their words. She could ask us our name, and we'd start to crack a sweat. And as luck would have it, when I started my grad program, she was on vacation. And she was also assigned to me as my advisor. Lucky me. So when I started my grad program, um, I was taken around by different instructors, and they, act, they, they said, you can do three different projects for your master's degree. You can do a histology project, you can do a biochemistry project, or you can do a histochemistry project. About three weeks later, Dr. Meyer returns from vacation, so this is the first time I met her. And of course, when she was gone, everybody was saying to me, Dr. Meyer is a very well-known researcher. She's really very well. Of course, they didn't tell me all the other parts, but they told me how, how uh, famous and accomplished she was. So when, I get back, when she got back from vacation, she sits down, and she asks me about the three different um, projects that were offered to me. And I go into detail on the three different projects, and I think in a fairly thoughtful and lucid manner. And when I finish, she looks at me and she says, it is obvious to me you have no idea of what you're talking about. <laughs> now, I wish I could say that things actually got better in the two years of my grad program. I could lie to you and say I charmed her to death and you know, things were great. But in our weekly meetings, um, 
it was almost like in the movie Animal House. All of us grad students felt like we were out, like on double super, super secret strict probation. We never knew if the axe was going to fall or what was going to happen. But there's some good news here. I got through the grad program. Why do you think I got through the grad program? There was one thing that I actually loved about my program. The material itself. I actually loved oral pathology. I loved general pathology. I loved oral pathology. I thought, this stuff is great. Where can I get some more of this? And so that carried me through my couple of years in grad school. And of course, because I wasn't tortured quite enough by Dr. Meyer, um, what else did I do? I signed up to go to dental school. So in 1981, also at the University of Illinois, I started my dental career. And it was actually in my freshman year that I had what I would consider my defining moment as a practitioner. We had a course as freshmen called Preventive Periodontics, where as part of the course, we would go down into the clinic as freshmen and do exams and prophies on our patients. Now, it's called a prophylaxis, right? You guys know what that means? That means to prevent disease. I'm not sure what disease I was preventing by doing a prophylaxis on those patients, but I'll let you guys think about that for a bit. So I finished the exam and the prophy on a patient, and I called the instructor over, and we saw the following. Just a good old-fashioned lingual cusp fracture on a lower molar. Now, the instructor said to me, it's really important to do a crown on this tooth to restore form and function and to prevent further breakage of the filling or the tooth, which sounded actually pretty good. And then the instructor went on to say, it's also important to do a crown because the constant rubbing of the tongue against this rough amalgam could cause a malignancy to develop. Now, remember, I just told you that I was also a grad student in oral pathology. And I was familiar with initiators and promoters of carcinogenesis. And I knew that in 19, I can't, even today, there's not much evidence. But in 1981, I can assure you, there was not a shred of evidence to suggest that chronic physical irritation could cause malignant transformation of cells. But because I was a freshman dental student with a rather strong desire to become a sophomore dental student, <laughs> I said, thank you, doctor, for that most interesting information. And I basically went about my business. That, and now, if you think that was the first time something was said to me by a clinical instructor at the now maybe not so prestigious University of Illinois, uh, you may want to think again. Because I present to you something that I've talked about and written about called dental school rules, a series of absolutes. Always do this. Never even think about doing that. Um, a, a code of conduct, if you will, to live by. So everything I'm going to show you on this list was told to me by a dental school instructor. All endodontic teeth need posts and crowns. So in other words, you get whacked in the mouth, it devitalizes, let's say, a maxillary central incisor. The tooth may only need a root canal and a filling, but you have to do a post and crown. All missing teeth must be replaced. I don't know if they're telling you this anymore. I think maybe not. Here's a beauty. All cases mounted in centric relation. Have I offended the faculty yet? Just let me know. Now, I'm probably not supposed to have any personal favorites here. But number four, OK, this stuff is like catnip to me, OK? For every time I heard you have to border mold or you have to use a face bow, it's not to say that border molding is bad. But we just don't have evidence for efficacy. We just simply don't know if border molding has any effect. Similar with face bow. And as, actually, with split cast technique, there was a randomized trial, uh, Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry in 2006. One group got split cast, the other group got a conventional partial, and both groups turned out exactly the same. Right, right. Never use cantilevers. We were told what a cantilever was, and then in the next breath, don't ever even think about using one of these. And then the example I gave you before, chronic irritation leads to malignant transformation of cells. So er again, everything was, that you see here was told to me by a dental and school instructor. In all cases, none of it was based on science, except for numbers two and five, which actually there was science to suggest just the opposite. We actually have research that missing teeth don't need to be replaced. And we actually have some evidence on cantilevers, that there are some indications where cantilevers might actually be effective. But this was 1981. So if I had ever said to my instructor, excuse me, doctor, could you uh, tell me what sort of evidence you have that all cases are mounted in centric relation? That was usually met with not the greatest response from our instructors. <laughs> now, 
I'm hoping your instructors here aren't packing heat, although I have to say Illinois is a conceal and carry state. Um, but even when I was a freshman dental student, I had one of my classmates say to an instructor, do you guys still do those PKT wax ups, by the way? Yes, no, yeah. The little, the three cone, four cone thing, okay. So a classmate of mine said to the instructor, you know, doctor, I don't understand why we're doing that. This kid's father was a dentist, and he said, I don't understand why we're doing this because I don't see how this will have any merit in terms of being a dentist. And she said to him, in front of the whole class, you know, if you want to make it through dental school, you better learn how to get your mouth shut. Okay? So welcome to dental school. All right. So then it was time to hit the dental clinic. Now I'm a third year student. And in the clinic, at that time, I don't know how it is now, but we had something called a comprehensive instructor. We had that one instructor who oversaw everything that we did. And one day, in 1983, do you guys remember the movie The Right Stuff? That was about Apollo 13? Yeah. Well, one fine day in dental school, my comprehensive instructor walked up to me and he said, you know, something happened that day in clinic, maybe it wasn't my finest day, and he said to me, you know, Elliot, I'm just not sure you have the right stuff to be a dentist. So now I'm in my third year of dental school. I've already had two years grad school, three years of dental school, this is five years at the University of Illinois. And now I'm wondering to myself, should I continue my career as a dentist and keep pursuing that line, or might I be better driving the Zamboni at the local ice rink? You know, it was kind of a toss-up. I wasn't really sure. Um, but I guess logic and reason prevailed, so I continued my dental education, and I made it through to graduation day, okay? Now, was I the most excited dental graduate around? Was I, you know, jumping for joy, brimming with confidence? Not exactly. I was sort of dragging my tail through my legs. I wasn't trying to make a lot of eye contact with my classmates at that point because I wasn't exactly inspired and full of confidence because of what happened with both Dr. Meyer as a grad student and my comprehensive instructor my junior year. So I have to tell you that, and plus I had all those scientific things that were told to me, some of which made sense, others which didn't make sense, and those were all rolling through my head. And so I have to say that even though there were times at the University of Illinois that I felt like maybe I was being mentored by these guys, you guys remember Drs. Howard Fine and Howard, um, that I actually, something good happened. Something really good happened. And that was 1985, where I was fortunate enough to be accepted into a general practice residency program, where I met this guy. Anybody know who this is? Dr. Green. Now, a couple things about Dr. Green. First of all, let me give you the setup. He ran the University of Illinois general practice residency program. And we had several feeder hospitals. We had Ravenswood Hospital, Illinois Masonic, Cook County, our county hospital. And we had seminars with him every Friday. Plus, at that time, and to this day, he was actually a pretty well-known, pretty well-respected dental researcher. He did um, TMD work. I don't know if you've heard of the Green and Laskin, Laskin and Green papers. Yeah, that was Dr. Green. So he did all that TMD work. So, so I had somebody who was now I, I was able to work with. And there were two really great things about Dr. Green. Number one. I now had that a sounding board. Remember all those things that were to told to me in dental school, some of which were scientific, some were completely non-scientific, with very little ability to discriminate which is which. Well, now I had somebody that I could bounce this stuff off of, and Dr. Green would say to me, he wouldn't just give me the answer, he would say, well, what do you think? What do you think is the answer? And so we'd actually look at the science together. And so when we started looking at the science together, a lot of the things, it was really validating for me because a lot of the science that was taught to me or told to me just didn't pass the smell test anymore. And so that was a really great thing because it was extremely validating for all those crazy thoughts I had in my head for all the science that just didn't make any sense. There was one other thing about Dr. Green. For the first time now in six years of formal dental education, I actually had somebody who had confidence in my ability, who actually believed in me. I had a mentor. Now, for the first time in six years, I had somebody who actually buoyed me up a little bit. I started feeling better about myself, and maybe I did belong here. And he, along with Dr. Wigdor, who was our uh, department chair in my residency, I think were really, really important to me for my professional development. So somebody that actually 
can inspire you, can actually mentor you, and instill some confidence, I think is a really important thing. So now I had a really good residency year. Very productive, had great seminars, feeling better about myself. And in just a few short years, I think because of some of the success that I had as a general practice resident, I actually became a program director myself in the general practice residency at Ravenswood. Now, there were a few things that I noticed when I was a general practice residency program director. First of all, who more than a program director is in an ideal position to see the finished product from dental school? That would be you guys, right? The dental graduate. So I was in a perfect position, and here's a few things that I noticed about dental graduates. Number one, they were pretty good at doing a filling, maybe a crown, maybe a, maybe a root canal, maybe an extraction. But when it came to diagnosis and treatment planning, not so good. Or actually making clinical decisions, um, kind of struggled a little bit. How do you think residents made decisions way back in 1985? Well, you can, you can give it a scientific term, but I'll just call it the Hey Dr. App theory, OK? Hey Dr. App, should I use a chamfer or a shoulder margin? Hey Dr. App, should I do amalgam or composite? What sort of antibiotic should I give? What sort of night guard should I make? So what did I notice? I noticed that, the, that basically residents were asking, they were, they, were saying, they were saying to me, you have the answer. I want the answer. Just hand it over. Just give it to me, right? And so I started thinking about that. So I started thinking that maybe they were trained the same way that I was trained. In other words, maybe they were trained to not think, to not make decisions. Just do what I say and don't ask why. So then I started wondering even further. So you combine the, their ability to make decisions with maybe all the crazy scientific stuff that was being taught to me. And what did I do with that? Well, I started getting more interested in the scientific foundations of dentistry myself. So I actually started a journal club. And this is what our journal club kind of looked like, OK? Um, some people were awake, maybe some not so much. And so what I wanted to do in journal club is really kind of go over all the different types of studies. We had randomized trials. We had systematic reviews. And I wanted to really see what kind of rapport can I get residents to now Instead of being so dependent on me to make clinical decisions, can I actually get them to make some of the decisions themselves? In other words, what I was trying to say to them is, science isn't a person. The science is the science. It's not one person that has all the answers. OK? And so we started the journal club shortly after I became program director. And we actually, I've continued it uh, to, this, to this very day. And it also helped me to develop my clinical skills and my research skills as well, because I didn't always know all the science in dentistry. So I really had to find out more of this kind of stuff myself. So a few years later, I ran into somebody at AADR and by the name of Mike Newman. And he said to me, you know, I'm starting a new evidence-based journal. Would you like to be on the editorial board? And so I said, sure. And you know, I think you are now all aware that we have two evidence-based journals. Yeah, everybody aware of that? And basically, do you know what they do? Everybody know what a critical summary is? So basically what they do is they take published research, and they'll write a critical summary. They'll write the methods, results, conclusions, and a little narrative. So my first paper comes to me and to, to do a critical summary myself, because now I'm on the editorial board. And the critical summary sheet comes with it. And it basically says, what's the study design? So I look at this paper, and I can't tell if it's a, control, if it's a case control study or, or a cohort study. So what do you do when that happens? What did I do? I phone a friend. You know, hey, Bill, what do you think? Well, Bill didn't know either. So I thought to myself, if I'm going to be on the editorial board of a journal and teach my residents evidence-based skills, it would probably help if I didn't suck at this stuff, right? So what did I do with that? Well, I took a course at Oxford in 2002. It was a course on evidence-based dentistry. It was a one-week course where we, Monday through Friday, basically looked how to search for evidence, write PICO questions, uh, look at systematic reviews, randomized trials, guidelines, diagnostic tests, and we really did the whole gamut. So for a science nerd like me, it was a great week. I mean, this was like 
getting in a pickup game with Wayne Gretzky. It just didn't get any better than that, okay? So I liked it so much that what did I do with that? I actually went on, and as it happened, at Oxford, they also had um, a brochure there that you could go and take a certificate program or, a, or a, um, another program leading up to a master's degree in evidence-based healthcare. So I actually enrolled in that program, and in three years, um, I got a master's degree in evidence-based healthcare, mentored by some really wonderful people, and I took some modules in statistics and systematic reviews. But I am a private practicing dentist, and whose practice did I join? I actually joined Dr. Green's practice. So what do we know about you know, getting some evidence, because this is what I do every day, right? I do what you guys do, right? Overhanging amalgams, non-retentive crowns, things like that. No, hopefully not, okay. Uh, hopefully you're doing some good stuff. Um, so I'm practicing general dentistry four days a week, and how do I take evidence and get that into the clinic? So let's take a few examples, and we'll kind of go over these. So I don't know if you're familiar with this term. It's called a bounded edentulous space. That's basically where we have a missing tooth, teeth on both sides. What do we know? What do we know scientifically about this? Is this a pathologic condition? Who here has heard of the disease of missing teeth? All right, yeah. Okay, so I'm not alone. I haven't heard of this either. So if it's not a disease, then maybe it's just a condition, right? So if it's a condition, are we going to treat it, yes or no? Well, we actually have evidence. What's the evidence if we do nothing? Do you guys know what the evidence says? What about the teeth that are going to end up like this? Are they going to end up like that? Well, as it turns out, we have some retro retrospective cohort studies that suggest that there is a minor self-limiting movement of teeth for the first year or so. But after that, usually things stabilize out because of the occlusion. Okay? So the idea that you, if you do nothing, we also know if you do nothing, what happens to the longevity of the abutment or the adjacent teeth as compared to actually putting in a bridge or, or a partial or an implant? Well, we actually have evidence to suggest that it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the longevity of the adjacent teeth, whether you restore the missing tooth or not. What do we know about survival rates of implants and bridges? What do you guys know about that? What does a little bit better, implants or three in a bridge? Implants, right? So what's the evidence? What would be the evidence that you would say to a patient? What's the survival rate? Well, we're probably up to about 20-year uh, data, and the survival rates are probably around 93, 94%, right? What about the three-unit bridge? What can we say about that? Yeah, after about 15 years, maybe about 25% of bridges have to be what? Repaired, re-cemented, remade, or catastrophic failure, right? Loss of an abutment tooth. That's evidence. That's evidence you can say to your patients. You can say that to your colleagues, right? So when Mrs. Jones shows up and she's got this, you can actually say to her that we have evidence that if we do nothing, bad things probably aren't going to happen. And if we do something, here's the survival rates. Now, since the survival rates are better on implants than bridges, does that mean we're no longer going to do three-unit bridges? Is that what EBD is all about? No. So we know that there's some circumstances where you actually might want to do a three-unit bridge, depending on that triad of here you've got some research evidence, but you've got a patient in your dental chair with certain needs and wants, and they might have crowns on adjacent teeth that may need to be redone or caries, et cetera. So that's how you practice EBD. Yeah. Now here's a, a photograph, an illustration rather, that appears. This appears in almost every North American textbook of prosthodontics. And they show a missing lower first molar, super eruption of the upper molar, some mesial drift, some distal drift. And, but curiously, this actually doesn't appear in any of the European journals of prosthodontics. So at first I was wondering, does this phenomenon of mesial drift or super eruption, does this only happen in Americans and not Europeans? But I quickly realized that that probably wasn't the case. And so you really do have these different options available to you. Okay. Amalgam versus composite. What do we know? Patient's sitting in your dental chair and says, I'd like that white filling. What are you going to say to them? Do you have, do you, can you quote evidence at this point in your career? And what would you say? 
the risk of recurrent decay with composite is what? This is audience participation. You can talk to me here. Well, from the, a large uh, randomized trial in JADA in 2007, the Bernardo study, we had a risk ratio of 3.5. What does that mean in plain English? The risk of recurrent decay is about three and a half times higher with composite as compared with amalgam. Okay? And it also depends on multi-surface and high carries risk and things like that. Okay? So does that mean we're no longer going to do posterior composites? You might want to pick and choose your cases, right? That's the evidence. There's also evidence from a Cochrane review that also found an increased risk of recurrent decay with composite compared to amalgam. So what sort of patient circumstances might you look at to, to do composite if they wanted white fillings versus silver fillings? Well, what about high-risk patient versus low-risk patient, right? What sort of thing would you like to see on an interproximal lesion? Would you rather have a supergingival margin or a subgingival margin? Would you like to, what's the stuff you'd like to see at the gingival margin of a preparation like that? You guys like charades? Three syllables, first letter E. Enamel, yeah, you might want to see some enamel at the gingival margin, right? So can you see how maybe the super gingival MO on a low risk patient with enamel at the gingival margin might be a better case than the deep DO, subgingival, no enamel on a high risk caries patient. Does that make some sense? So that's where you take the evidence. We know the evidence, but you have to now adapt it to a certain patient and you have to see what their, what their clinical circumstances. Everybody good on that? Good, good. All right, let's take another example here. We actually have an example where we're in the clinic now where we have good evidence, but for a whole host of reasons, it's not being adopted into practice. What's the poster child in dentistry these days for where we actually have good evidence, but a lot of dentists aren't using it? Just go ahead and say the word. Say it loud, say it proud. Yeah, we have evidence that only 40% of dentists are using Yes, good, I think I heard it. <laughs> you can say it, it's okay. It's not a dirty word. What do we know? So now I've got, now I've got Mrs. Jones and her precious little son, Johnny, and I wanna do uh, sealants on little Johnny, and the parent says to me, well, are sealants effective? So what would you say to, to a parent of a patient like that? What does the evidence say? Does anybody know the current evidence on sealants? Not that you should, exactly. OK. We have a Cochrane review. We've got an updated Cochrane review. We've got an ADA clinical practice guideline that's in the process of being updated. And we've got our friends, the Scotsmen. And they have a guidance, too. Scotsmen are not only good at making scotch, but they do really good guidelines. Okay. So what does it say? Well, the recent Cochrane review had an odds ratio of 0.12. Anybody want to put that into plain English for me? Or plain Canadian, if you will. We've got a great organization, the great offensive club. Hey. OK. In plain English, what would we say? We would say that sealants, as compared to no sealants, reduces the risk of caries by what percent? With an odds ratio of 0.12? 88%. Let this man graduate early, would you please? <laughs> now, we don't deal a lot in odds. We deal in risk. So the corresponding risk ratio would probably, depending on the baseline event rate, would probably be around 0.2. In plain English, then, we would say to a patient or a colleague that on average, Sealants reduce the risk of caries by 80%, right? Are you guys impressed by that number? Let's see a show of hands. Who is impressed by a risk ratio of 0.2? Hands up for impressed. Who is not impressed? And anybody in this country illegally couldn't vote? No. All right, well, I'm with you guys. <laughs> Thank you for your, you didn't have to answer that question. That was, you know, that was really just a rhetorical, silly comment that I made. You didn't really have to answer that. But, but thank you for your honesty. 
Are you in this country okay? Everything's good? He's all right, good. All right, good. Okay. So now we, we're impressed by that. And you, you guys nailed it. You got it right. Why are you impressed by that? Tell me why you're impressed by that kind of... Let's compare it with our buddy here, Mr. Fluoride. Give me a risk ratio. On average, fluoride rinses, gels, and varnish reduce caries risk by what percent? Give me a number. Sorry? 24%. Yeah, that's what I... I think we got a ringer here. <laughs> I, think, I think we got a ringer. Because um, I would have said 24%. <laughs> but yeah, somewhere between 20 and 25, probably 24 is going to be your number, right? Okay. Now, are you impressed by that number? Well, what do you think most medical interventions come in at? Your antihypertensives, your cholesterol medication. Where do you think those risk ratios are? Point 0.8. Yeah, most of the medications we take, they reduce the risk of disease by about 20%. So they're kind of around the fluoride area. Where do you think, what else has the sealant kind of reduction in risk of an 80 some percent reduction in risk? What medicines do we call those? Where NNTs, you guys know what NNTs are? Yeah? What does it stand for? Number needed to treat. NNTs on sealants are, what's the best NNT you can have? One, right? And the NNTs on sealants are right around two or three, depending on baseline event rate, which we're not going to talk about. What else has NNTs that low? What kind of medicine where almost every patient you give a medication, they do better? Uh, it's actually not aspirin. It's something where they got a disease, you give a pill, and they get better. Think of cause and effect. What disease, where we say A causes B? It's the world of infections. So our best antibiotics and antivirals have NNTs right around 1.5, 2.8. So sealants in the dental world are like the antibiotics in the medical world. They basically have probably the best efficacy. So not only is the benefit of sealants statistically significant, clinically relevant, but what can we say about the magnitude of the effect? It's got an extremely large magnitude of effect. Do you think if the average dentist practicing in anywhere USA knew that, do you think they might start to use sealants? I would hope so because we don't have a lot of things like sealants that have this large of a magnitude of effect. Okay? All right. Or let's say your patient shows up and they have a prosthetic hip or knee and you're about to do a cleaning on them or a, an extraction or something like that and they say to you, should I take antibiotics before you do this procedure? So what are you going to say to them? Anybody feeling lucky today? Anybody want to volunteer and give me an answer? In general, what are you going to say? Consult with the orthopedic surgeon, right? Put it in their court. Drop kick on three. Yeah. <laughs> what else might we say? Well, do you want to quote the evidence first? Good idea? All right, quote the evidence for me. Let me have it. Give it to me. Give it to me. Did you happen to see the recent guidelines that were updated in the January data? I'll show it to you in a few minutes. What did they say? What was the overall conclusion? Right. They said, yeah. and why did they say, in general, don't give antibiotics? You can have worse effects from antibiotics. Excellent. What was our PICO question when we looked at the guidance here? What, what was our PICO question? Well, we were looking at harm, right? So we weren't looking at differences between groups. We were actually looking at association between groups. All right, so what's the PICO question? I'll start you guys off. How's that? It's Friday. Is there an association? You want more? Between dental procedures and finish it off for me, PJI. That's what you were going to say. Yes. Yeah. Is there an association between dental procedures and prosthetic joint infection? That was PICO question one, all right? 
and we had evidence, and it failed to show an association. What was PICO question two? I'll start you out. Do antibiotics, help me out, do, do antibiotics reduce, we actually didn't look at bacteremia. What do we call bacteremia in the world of EBD? It's called a something, it's called a blank outcome. What is blank? You guys like charades? Three syllables, first letter S. Surrogate, right? Yeah, bacteremia is a surrogate outcome. And that means it's sort of along the pathway, but we, we don't like surrogates that much. Why don't we like surrogates? Because you can have a good effect on a surrogate and really a negative effect on a true outcome of care, okay? So we're gonna skip over this. I'll come back to that, how's that? All right, so now I've got my master's degree in evidence-based healthcare. I did actually a Cochrane systematic review on replacement of missing teeth in the partially absent dentition, bridges, partials, and uh, implants. And so I wanted to do more with my EBD. So what did I do? What do you think I did? Go to the AB, ADA's EBD website, and do you see, this is the old site, but do you see that button there? Volunteer to become an evidence reviewer. So I clicked the button, and I became an evidence reviewer where we actually now took a, a workshop. We actually learned how to write critical summaries. But at that point, I thought, geez, the people who are teaching me are really my sort of my colleagues, not really my mentors. So shortly thereafter, they put me on the critical review panel, okay, where I actually now ran workshops, mentored residents, and mostly dentists on how to write critical summaries. And then there were a few more things that I started doing, because the ADA, because of their EBD center, had more opportunities for me to, to develop my skills. So everybody's heard of the advanced EBD workshop. I think a lot of faculty, some faculty have taken it. It started off at Forsyth. Well, it was taught by Derek Richards and Rick Niederman, the two guys who taught that one-week course that I had taken at Oxford. And they had been criticized in the past because they didn't really have a lot of statistics and they didn't really, uh, they, they actually needed somebody to teach the statistics. So they, uh, they called me up and said, hey, would you mind teaching the biostats for the, uh, for the workshop? And I said, sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to do so. And we kind of went you know, around how I was going to teach it and how I was going to present it. And then Rick said to me at the end of the phone call, Rick Niederman, he said, oh, and by the way, Elliot, um, there's going to be a couple of statisticians taking the workshop. <laughs> I kind of wish Rick hadn't said that. Yeah, it was sort of, you know, associated with a little gastrointestinal distress. But um, I got past it, worked on the workshop. We had a really great week, and we've actually run the workshop for about the last five years. It's now at NYU because Rick Niederman went from Forsyth to NYU. And we also have, I probably should learn to stand up a little straighter, um, we run faculty development workshops. So if faculty here is interested, the ADA actually comes out and we'll do a one day, two day, even a three day workshop. Here was one of our first ones at Loma Linda, which was a two day workshop. Because if faculty is gonna teach all of you critical appraisal skills, then the faculty, you don't want just one or two faculty members to have these kinds of skills. So we run these workshops as well. And I've done some other things, such as a series on statistics. So if anybody is interested in actually learning more about EBD or stats, you can just go to the EBD website, and there's tutorials, all free, open access to anyone who is interested. And we also have some science podcasts. Those are run by my friend and, um, and colleague, Bob Wyant. And we have about 15 or so podcasts on the website as well on a variety of topics. And this is the new website, if anybody's interested. So now we have some drop-down things. So there's two things on this screen right now that when you guys graduate, you can actually sign up for them uh, at any time. The Champions Conference, which is a really nice intro to EBD conference, it's going to be held two days prior to the ADA annual session, November 3rd and 4th. And then there's still that button down there to be a volunteer. So if anybody wants to learn more or do critical summaries, that, along with the EBD journals and many things on the website, a lot of the things that you're now aware of are great ways um, to get more involved uh, in EBD if you want to improve your skills. And that brings us back to dental procedures and PJI. So are you guys aware of some of the controversy on this topic? Are the students aware of this business, some of the stuff that went on, uh, whether to give antibiotics or not give antibiotics? Um, so let me go back and give you the historical perspective on this. 1997, 
in 2003, the ADA got together with the AAOS, and they really formed guidance. And the 2003 guidance, a lot of people don't actually remember what the heck it said. It actually said, in general, you don't need antibiotics. Only, the only people who actually need them are people who are high risk and only for the first two years. So what did we all do with that? We just threw antibiotics at everybody, right? Now, and I think the faculty can probably, when I was first in practice, and do you remember all the pre-medication for SBE, right? When I was in first, in, I mean, if you had hypertension, you needed antibiotics. If you had any sort of heart problem, you, need a high, you needed antibiotics. I think you almost, you didn't actually have to go in the dental office to need antibiotics. You could drive past the dental office and you needed antibiotics. We were throwing antibiotics at everybody, okay? And why were we doing that? We were doing that because it's commonly thought that there must be a correlation between A and B. And that's the world of epidemiology. Is there a correlation between an exposure and an outcome, okay? Dental procedures and SBE, dental procedures and PJI. And what did we find out? Well, what do we know? Do you guys know much about correlations and causations and things like that? In the world of epidemiology, it's pretty easy to find correlations between A and B. If I look for a statistical correlation between periodontal disease and gray hair, do you think I would find one? Yeah, why? Because they're both correlated with aging, which is a confounder, okay? You guys have just called me old, I'm okay with it. What else do we know? Well, when you look at things observationally, obs now everybody knows what an observational study is versus a randomized trial, yeah? Everybody's good with that? Okay, so when we look at observational studies and we find an effect, what happens when we then do randomized trials? Okay, in other words, here's my, let's do a little finger puppets. Here's my null value. Here's my estimate from an observational study. It's out here, it's not at the null. And then I do a randomized trial. There's only three things that can happen when I switch from observational studies to trials. It can exaggerate the effect, it can minimize the effect, or it can stay the same. What happens as I go from an observational design to a trial? Does it tend to exaggerate, minimize, or stay the same? Hands up for exaggerate. Hands up for minimize. And hands up for stay the same. This is a good crowd. It does. It minimizes. Example, do you guys remember juicing? Do you remember people were like, I think they're still doing it. They're taking bunches and bunches of carrots and throwing them in a blender and they're slugging this stuff down, and man, I feel great, even though they're turning six shades of orange. <laughs> Remember that stuff? Well, there were some cohort studies. Those are observational studies, and what did they find? They found that this beta-carotene supplementation actually reduced cardiovascular mortality. Cohort studies. And then they did randomized trials, and what happened? It not only moved that summary estimate closer to the null, it actually flipped to the other side of the null, and what does that mean? It actually caused harm. And if you don't like my beta carotene example, you can substitute vitamin E. Same phenomenon happened. And if you don't like vitamin E, I only have three words for you. Hormone replacement therapy, right? Same exact thing happened. The observational studies showed a benefit. The randomized trials actually showed that it was, it was actually harmful to heart health, okay? So what, what then does all this tell us? Well, it tells us that correlations, we sort of always think, that there must be a correlation between A and B, and dental procedures must be correlated with infective endocarditis and PJI. Well, I think you know from your physiology, at least there's some biologic plausibility to the SBE phenomenon, right? Because we know that the bugs on infected heart valves are oftentimes strep bugs, but what do we know about the PJI bugs? What are they most commonly? What's the most common bug? Staph, and where is that from? Skin. And what is most highly associated with getting a prosthetic joint infection? The patients who had prosthetic joint infections, the most common things that happened to them were non-dental. And do you know what they were? Perioperative or post-arthroplasty wound dehiscence and post-arthroplasty wound infection. All the PGI folks had those. None of the control patients had those, okay? So are you guys now aware that periodontal disease is associated with every malady known to man. <laughs> and if you, think I'm, if you think I'm making this stuff up, 
check this out. This was an observational study. <laughs> observational study. This was a cohort study. Yes, a cohort study. And why, why stop at a cohort? Let's do a randomized trial, OK? And they found a p-value. Do not ask me what p stands for in this study. <laughs> and that's, that's all I'm going to say on that, OK? So it's getting crazy out there, OK? Is periodontal disease even associated with some of the most common things, like heart disease, OK? So let's back that up a second, and we'll go to this. So this was what appeared in the January JADA. Everybody somewhat familiar with this paper? So I was on this committee, along with Tom Salcedo and a few other of my pals. And this came out because, as part of the AOS guidance, what did the AOS guidance say from 2012? It said practitioners might consider discontinuing the use of antibiotics, blah, blah, blah. Right, was that as clear as mud? Yeah, clear as mud. And why do we say something really vague like a practitioner might consider? Well, we had to because we we're playing under AOS's rules. And if you only had one study of direct evidence and it was an observational study, you could only use the word might. You could certainly not say suggest, and you couldn't say recommend. So all we could say is you might consider. So that was kind of a clumsy statement. And as it happened, the ADA was inundated with phone calls. We don't understand this. This is fuzzy. We don't know what to do. We're afraid of getting sued. So um, a few years ago, I was um, nominated to be on ADA's Council on Scientific Affairs. And we formed a subcommittee. Now, when I first started on the Council on Scientific Affairs, my first meeting, we spent really looking for the first three hours, I think it was a full half day, on looking at the SEAL program. Now, I don't know about you guys, but after about an hour of talking about Fred Flintstone toothpaste and Sponge, SpongeBob SquarePants uh, fluoride rinse, I was thinking about 10 different ways to kill myself because I was thinking, what the heck did I sign up for here? But the news is, it got better. We actually started talking about things. Not that the SEAL program doesn't matter, if anybody's listening or recording this. I can change my name and move out of state if I have to. But we started talking about real science, and we formed a subcommittee to look at this problem. And on the subcommittee, what did we find out? We were only really going to clarify the 2012 guidelines from AOS. But a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. We found three other papers, two of which the AOS did actually not include, which they, they really should have. They were also case control studies. And what did they all say? They all said basically the same thing, that there was no association. We actually had an odds ratio on the largest paper of 0.8. Now, with an odds ratio of 0.8, if that, was, if that confidence interval was narrow enough to cause this to be statistically significant, what would you conclude from that study? If the odds ratio is less than the null, what would you say about dental procedures and PJI? Remember, this is not an odds ratio greater than 1. It was actually less than 1. You would have to say to a patient that dental procedures High risk, low risk, with or without antibiotics, are actually protective against prosthetic joint infection. You want to avoid having a PJI? Go have a bunch of teeth taken out without antibiotics. That's your best protection. Okay? Now, we didn't say that because most of the summary estimates did not cross the null. We found no association. But most of them were trending towards a reduction in the odds of having dental procedures for the patients who had had prosthetic joint infections. So that's what we came out with and said the current best evidence failed to demonstrate an association between dental procedures and prosthetic joint infection. Now, who here is, knows the difference between evidence-based dentistry and standard of care? Because a lot of people say, well, what if I'm the one person who gets, you know, I, give, I don't give the antibiotics and my patient gets an infection, okay? Because that's still EBD. So what's the answer to that? Well, my answer is always kind of the same. Are you in practice because you're interested in promoting and preserving the oral health of your patients, or are you in practice to prevent yourself from getting sued? Okay? I hope it's the former, not the latter. But you do have to keep in mind that hopefully we're in business because we're really here to take care of our patients, ultimately. And there's a difference between evidence-based dentistry and standard of care. Evidence-based dentistry is a health care term. Standard of care is what kind of term? What do we call that term? That's a legal term, right? Is it possible to practice evidence-based dentistry and violate the standard of care? Yeah, and how can we do that? Guy comes into your office, has a central incisor that's periodontally involved, needs to be removed. You remove it, and you don't give antibiotics. Is that practicing in an evidence-based manner? 
It is, yeah, because there's no evidence that antibiotics are needed in that situation. But what if the guy develops an infection? They get you on the witness stand, excuse me, doctor, but everyone in your area that we contacted and polled gives antibiotics. Congratulations, you've just practiced evidence-based dentistry, but you have violated the standard of care because you have deviated what all the other guys in your area or in your neighborhood commonly do. Now, that's if you're in a fry state. There's two types of states, fry state and daubert state. Illinois is still a fry state. I don't know if Michigan is converted to Daubert or if they're still fry. Daubert simply means that instead of what everybody in your area does, we're not going to look at that as much as the actual science, okay? Because I've done expert witness work on oral cancer where I, where I was defending dentists who were being sued for oral cancer, non-diagnosis, and I had a Cochrane review, and I had a clinical practice guideline. And the lawyer said to me, don't bring it. And I said, why shouldn't I bring it? It's, it's high quality science. And he said, it could be used as against you, it's hearsay. And he said to me, you don't understand. He said, you, Elliot, you live in the world of scientific truths. We lawyers, we live in the world of winning and losing. So when he said that to me, I kind of turned my stomach a little bit, didn't really do a whole lot of expert witness work after that. But that's the difference. I mean, we're in the healthcare world. We have to do what's in our best interests for our patients. And you know, lawsuits can always happen for almost a whole host of reasons. Um, but obviously, using the best quality evidence, it, it certainly is an asset, but it's not your protector. It's not your shield in, in a court of law. OK. Now, somewhere after you get out of here, or maybe even now, have you guys been subjected to dentistry today or dental economics? What do we call those? Dental uh, tabloids. tabloids, right? <laughs> tabloids, throwaway journals, right. So somewhere along the line, you're going to come in contact with thought leaders, opinion leaders. Now, every year in our journal club at Masonic, I ask, we have quizzes, and I ask a question ahead of time. We do pre-tests and post-tests post and things like that. And I ask this question every year. Who is the founding father, or one of the founding fathers of evidence-based medicine? And because I happen to be a really nice guy, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I am a really nice guy, I give them four choices. Now, you might notice that two of those choices, you might want to just drop kick them right away, right? Um, Mick Jagger continues to be the lead singer for the Rolling Stones. You guys all know him. And Al Gore might have invented the internet, but I can assure you, he doesn't know anything about evidence-based healthcare. So that leaves this guy and this guy. Now, over the last 15 years, with about 10 residents each year, I've probably asked 100, almost 150 residents this question. And only about a handful of residents have actually gotten this question correct. Now, at about this point, are you starting to think maybe the correct answer is not C? Is that rattling through your head at this point? Is anything rattling through your head at this point? When's lunch, maybe? Yeah, the correct answer is actually A which really just goes to show that sometimes thought leaders or opinion leaders, we just sort of extrapolate that they must have all the answers. And the take home message here is no one person has all the knowledge or has all the answers. Nobody knows all the evidence on all these topics. No EBD expert, no, no scientific guru or anybody else, okay? So that's why it's the science and not a human being that should be, I hope, your guide. And not so much over dependence on instructors or what your colleagues think. I mean, those are important things, but you still have evidence to help guide you through all these things. So let's give you a wrap up, shall we? Well, I had a defining moment. I thought my defining moment was going to be oral pathology. It was my first love. I still love it today. But that, that broken tooth way back when in 1981, that turned out to be my defining moment as a healthcare practitioner. I simply could not believe that somebody said something to me that was not grounded in science. Perhaps it was my own naivety, but I just wasn't really able to, to comprehend that. Now, maybe you guys have had a, de a defining moment. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. But we know through even your Pathways program, you might have had some inspiration for a defining moment. Maybe for some of you, it's military service. Maybe for some of you, it's treatment of special needs patients. Maybe somebody wants to become involved in organized dentistry. Okay. I don't expect too many of you to end up being a science nerd like I am, okay? That would be unreasonable to assume that. But I would certainly hope 
that at least incorporating science into your practice is something that is important to you because it's something that will always be available to you. What's another take home message here? I hope you guys believe in yourself. I mean, can we be honest here? You guys are graduating seniors from the University of Michigan Dental School. If you really didn't have the knowledge, the wherewithal, or the competence to be a good practitioner, I don't think you'd be sitting in this room today. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean that when you start day one of your residency program or day one of your associateship that you're going to be doing impacted wisdom teeth or roundhouse crown and bridge work or big boy uh, implant cases. But what it means is you should hopefully have some confidence in yourself and that you can start doing the easier stuff first and take your time and give it a while, give it a year or two or three until you start feeling comfortable and confident that you can go to bigger cases, okay? Because if you want to drag that I'm not good enough ball and chain around with you for the next 20 or 30 years, like I almost did, thanks to some experiences I had in dental school, you can drag that ball and chain around with you if you choose to. But I think that would be really sad because I think that's, that's the kind of stuff that's really avoidable and it's not your buddy. You don't want voices in your head telling you you aren't good enough. And why do I make a deal out of this? I make a deal out of this because if there's one thing I noticed as a residency program director and somebody who's been practicing dentistry for about 30 years now, what is highly associated with an unsuccessful practitioner? I think the most highly, thing, the, the most highly associated phenomenon is somebody who is skittish and does not have confidence in their abilities. It's almost to me like animals in the wild. They can sense fear. And if you're afraid, that's going to get transmitted to a patient. So again, I don't expect people to be confident on day one. But somewhere along the line, you have to believe in yourself. And I sincerely hope that that's the case with everybody here. Mentorship. I hope I described to you how I limped out of dental school, not feeling too good about myself, and I was really propped up by having people that I respected believe in me and having confidence in my ability. So hopefully you have some mentors here in dental school. Hopefully you'll have somebody in a residency program or in an associateship when you start off. But it's very helpful that if somebody offers you mentorship, you should probably consider it, okay? Because these things are very, very helpful for professional development. Now, there's one thing that never went away with me. One of the, I think, repeating themes here has been scientific curiosity. So I'm still the science nerd I was 30 years ago. And I hope my story is still being written, that I'm not done. So we're now starting with some oral cancer guidelines. So the ADA is going to be updating their oral cancer guidelines. And why are we going to be doing that? Is oral cancer the same as cancers of the breast, cervix, and colon? No, it ain't. With various diagnostic tests, those three cancers that I just mentioned have much lower mortality rates and much lower incidence over time. But when it comes to oral cancer, we're not doing too good, guys. We're about the same as we were 50 years ago with incidence and mortality. So we're going to start looking at why is that. And hopefully, we can figure out some strategies for earlier detection, because most cases are, are really late stage disease when they're diagnosed. There's another program. Has anybody here heard of the Choosing Wisely program? That ring a bell at all? Choosing Wisely is an initiative. If anybody's interested, just go ahead and Google up Choosing Wisely. It's an initiative from the American Board of Internal Medicine where about 60 now different medical specialties have had a list of statements on diagnostic tests that are not needed, expensive, procedures that are ineffective or can be harmful. And the ADA now is involved in the Choosing Wisely program. I'm part of that panel. And it's been great because we're really looking at systematic reviews and guidelines to help develop um, statements that can be used by you, the profession, and by the public as well. So if anybody here is interested in working on ADA panels or clinical practice guidelines or sitting at the table when we're talking about clinical practice guideline development, you might consider getting involved in some of these ADA activities that I mentioned. But even if you aren't, even if you practice general dentistry for 30 years or go into a specialty, I hope one thing you'll consider, and that is systematic reviews, clinical summaries, and clinical practice guidelines. Because they're available to you, and they're actually, the work has been done for you. You don't even have to critically appraise evidence yourself. You can actually 
have it done for you. And I hope that's something that you'll stay current because the bottom line, guys, if you ignore evidence today, you will, in 20 years from now, you will practice exactly how you practiced as a senior dental student at Michigan. Where, what happens to evidence over time? It matures and it evolves. So if you want to be stuck in 2015, then ignore the evidence. But it's going to be changing, and it's changing rapidly and constantly. And I think now you have the tools to be able to keep up with evidence. Little tip, in the December issue of the EBD Journal, they do a yearly wrap-up of all the evidence that they've summarized that year. That's one of the two dental journals that I mentioned before. But you've got the ADA website, you've got two EBD journals, you've got guidelines, you've got the ADA news, and, and all these different things, even morning huddle, that are hopefully promoting evidence and e making it easy to, to stay current with, with the evidence. So ultimately, guys, I hope if you have half as much success as my boys here, that you will all have an illustrious 30 or 40 year dental career. I thank you for your attention. I hope this is a great day for you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Does anybody, any thoughts, questions, comments? Happy to answer anything that. I'll just make a quick comment. We will dismiss from here and go to Palmer. You all know we've got the sessions, the orals, and the posters to set up. You, and we have them set them up if you need that. If you have a question for Dr. App, please ask it, and then we'll dismiss from here and go to Palmer. Anything about cross-checking or high-sticking anybody needs to know about? Everybody's good? Yes, sir. What do you find, as you lecture on this subject, what do you find is the biggest misconception about evidence-based dentistry? OK, so his question was, as I lecture on EBD, what's the biggest misconception? I have to say, historically, it would be a couple things. that that evidence-based dentistry is being used by the insurance companies to limit or deny claims. And, and I think I can hopefully dispel that rumor because we just talked about the evidence with three unit bridges and single tooth implants. Um, what do insurance companies typically cover? They cover the bridge. They don't cover the implant. So if they were going to use EBD to deny claims, they would actually start denying the bridge and start covering the implants, which is being very slow in, 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 in coming into to play. Um, but I think a lot of practitioners, you know, kind of the seasoned, we'll say seasoned practitioners, the old guys, the old guard, they're very suspicious of it. And why do you think that is? Why do you think not your generation, but my generation is very suspicious of evidence-based practice? They have to change. Yeah, they have to change. And, you know, change is difficult for a lot of reasons. I don't know if you're aware, there's a whole bunch of evidence on change management, tons and tons, and reasons why we don't change. Um, and what do dentists do traditionally? Well, that's different from physicians. Physicians work in a place, it's a big place, it's called a hospital, where they have to interact with each other, and there's, you know, you know quality assurance, and there's M&M conference, and so they kind of keep each other in check. What do we do? We go into our cubby holes and do whatever the heck we want, and really, nobody says anything to us because nobody's watching. And a lot of dentists like that. Well, what do you mean I should incorporate evidence? What do you mean most dentists feel that they are practicing evidence-based dentistry? So it can almost be offensive to tell them that they're not practicing in an evidence-based manner. So I think that's one of the biggest things um, that's a, a, a big barrier, change, insurance companies denying things. And what have you guys learned about evidence-based healthcare? Is this um, complicated, or is this pressing the easy button? It's complicated. I agree with you. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for 15, 20 years. I mean, there's days where it brings me to my knees, OK? And it's difficult stuff. It's not intuitive, oftentimes counterintuitive. And I don't know if you guys have ever had statistics or have gone in depth on statistics. But this stuff is difficult. So you're not talking about something that's easy in, in terms of a concept. And then you're talking about something that's a threat to somebody's practice, that maybe it'll limit or deny some sort of claim. And any time you threaten somebody's livelihood, uh, example, um, caries management strategies, right? What, what's happening with caries management? Well, we've gone from something called a handpiece to something called fluoride and floss in medical management of caries. So any time you take a handpiece out of somebody's hand, you're affecting their income. So these things are threatening. And I think those are probably the, the biggest threats that, you know, that we face. Yeah. Any other? Thoughts, questions, or comments? Or are you all sitting there in stunned silence? 
All right, well, thanks again for your attention. Enjoy the day. Congratulations. <laughs>